Hi, I'm Todd. I'm going to be giving you a review of Lynn Flewelling's Luck in the Shadows. It is book one of the Night Runner series. Here's the cover. My copy is a little bit beat up. I carried it around with me in my backpack um, during a recent European trip. Um, I normally take better care of my books, but it was uh, jostled around a bit. <clears throat> so to start, I was um, I was looking for a new series of, of fantasy books. I just finished uh, Ursula Le Guin's Ursi series. And it was a bit of a milestone for me. I just finished uh, nursing school. I just graduated. And I just had passed my state board and became an RN. So I was looking for a bit of a celebratory uh, book series. Um, I mainly read fantasy. And I prefer series. So I had this trip that kind of my gift to myself for graduating was uh, a trip back to Ireland. This was my second time. And um, I was kind of doing some, some searches on the web for um, fantasy series with gay characters, preferably gay main characters. And this series kept coming back up and I said you know what let me give it a try couldn't find it in my local shop which is where I prefer to to buy books so I ordered the first four of them online I believe there's nine in the series so um, I actually started reading this book as the plane was taking off um, to go to Ireland and um, I'm terribly afraid of flying, so I think I got 10 pages read on the t entire eight hour flight to Dublin. So when I started reading the book, I was a bit distracted, but it starts off with uh, you're right into the action. Um, there are two main characters, Alec and Sarah Gill. And Alec has been captured in a dungeon and is being tortured for a crime that he didn't commit. So that's how you meet. You, you jump right into it with Lynn Fowell. So a little bit about the two main characters. There is Alec and Sarah Gill. Alec is... Um, 15 or 16 years old. He's from the northern portion of the world. Um, he is kind of an innocent, not very worldly, not very experienced kind of a kid um, who's just been orphaned. Um, I can't remember what happened to his mother, but his father um, had been killed recently or passed away um, just before the story starts. So here is this young kid um, not really knowing where he belongs in the world. Um, he's got some serious skills as far as um, hunting and, and trapping. He's also very, very skilled with a bow and arrow. Um, so that definitely comes into play. Um, then we have Sarah Gill, who is kind of the opposite of Alec in a lot of ways, meaning he is very experienced, very well traveled. Um, you start to learn, you don't know a lot about Sarah Gill at first. You kind of immediately know that he's kind of a very outspoken, kind of cocky kind of guy. Um, 
but what's so cool about Flewelling is he, she kind of, in some fantasy novels, you've got to get to like the last 20 pages before you really learn much and or get your questions answered, I should say. Whereas uh, in this book, in the way that Flewelling's style is, she kind of like drops little reveals throughout the book. So you constantly kind of feel very satisfied with um, the progress progression of the novel. Um, the world in the, these books um, is so cool, I think. Very well done. Um, you get a cool little map in the front of the book, and if you're like me, you like to kind of go back and forth and follow where the characters are questing around at. And it's kind of divided into three different countries, let's say. Um, you've got Mycena, which is the northern part of the lands where the where Alec is from and where you start in um, in book one. And you have um, Scala, which is you find out later without giving any um, spoilers, is kind of where the crux of the story takes place. You spend the most of your time in, in Scala. Then you have Plenimar, which is uh, uh, kind of, they're kind of mean, they're kind of jerks there. They're trying to take over the, the world and, and that part of the world. Um, also you have down at the very south, southern part of the world is uh, Aranen, difficult to pronounce, but it's a land where these beings called Aranfe live. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and they are creatures that live to be um, centuries old. Um, from what I can tell, they um, are kind of, they remind me kind of like the way the elves are presented in a lot of fantasy novels. They look a lot like human beings, but they all have, or most of them, I believe, have um, magical powers. Um, and they've kind of spread across the lands and have interbreeded with some of the human uh, uh, population and have produced these kind of half-breed folk who um, also have magical powers. The magic in the novel is, I think, really, really cool. You're born with it, and there is a school that you can go to um, in Scala in a town called Rimini, and it's a place called the Oreska House. And that's where you go if you are talented in magic and kind of to hone your skills. So there were a lot of criticisms of the series that I, I read, and I should really learn not to read um, too many reviews of, of books before I try them myself. Of course, life is too short for bad books, so I try not to, uh, I take everything with a grain of salt, but one thing that I, uh, that kept coming up was um, that Flewelling uses an exorbitant amount of exposition. I read that over and over and I just did not think so. Um, I didn't agree with that at all. She certainly um, g gives great detail. Um, but to me, and, and, and what I like to read, um, I like to have my surroundings described. It paints a picture in my mind and really makes me feel like I'm there. Um, and with this book, I mean, I really felt like I was there in the with these characters. I, I loved her use of exposition. And um, I, I thought, I did not think it was too much. I thought um, it was perfect, not too much, not too, just 
painted a perfect picture for you and uh, gave you a good uh, backdrop for the scenes that were happening. Um, another criticism that I read, well, uh, I saw a couple of, I'm an assuming straight guys who had picked this up unknowingly and were a bit thrown off by the gay themes, but I wouldn't call this a gay book, even though I found it um, in a list that was uh, books with gay main characters and saw that, and it's listed in, in certain lists as being a, a gay book. But I, I really disagree with that. The way that Flewelling handles um, themes of bisexuality or homosexuality, um, I thought was really well done in that it wasn't gimmicky, if that makes sense. It was kind of like it is in real life, meaning being gay or bisexual isn't like the central theme of your life. It's a part of who you are, but it doesn't kind of rule you. And I thought it was done in a very beautifully understated way. I, I really thought that, um, a couple times I thought, my, my goodness, has this woman lived another life as a, as a, as a gay man? You might understand what I mean when you read it, but it, it's just uh, so understated. Um, in the first book, there really is no... Um, Alec and Sarah Gell are... What makes it realistic? They're still kind of um, figuring each other out. Um, a couple times I'm like, okay, just jump on him, you know. But uh, <laughs> um, it's very sweet in a lot of ways, meaning, for example, without giving anything away, uh, Sarah Gill will be kind of just observing Alec and will have a, a kind of bubbling up of a feeling and he won't, he, he either try to push it away or he doesn't really want to understand it yet. Um, Another example, you know, he, Sarah Gill's kind of inner monologue, he's questioning why, what is he doing with this kid? Oh, uh, what's, what, what is the real, what is this, what does he have a motive that he's not really thought through? Is he really bringing this boy on as a student? There's certainly a theme of um, teacher and student. Um, where Sarah Gill being the, the teacher, um, teaching Alec uh, his skills in this kind of subterfuge, spy kind of lifestyle that he leads, and Alec being the, um, the student or pupil. Uh, it reminds me of kind of the Greek thing, the ancient Greek, where there'd be an older man and a younger, you know, not the point of pedophilia, but there are things in the book. Sarah Gill is older than Alec. But once you read on and you learn more about Sarah Gill, you kind of see that they might be in similar life stages. So it kind of, it kind of makes sense. It's not creepy is what I mean. So another thing I thought was interesting is the theme of religion in the book. Um, for well, it's kind of a central part, not a central part, but it, it definitely has a place in this book. There are four gods um, and four major holidays. And the characters in the book often refer to time uh, using one of these holidays, like the third day of um, the Spring Festival. 
um, or the winter solstice. It reminds me, like the four seasons, four gods. It's very circular. Um, it remind like one of them kind of reminds me of Halloween. One is similar to Christmas. One's like Easter kind of. Um, so I thought that was really interesting, and it really adds a texture to these books. Um, another theme that's recurring is shadows. Luck in the shadows, being the title of the book. Over and over, um, shadow is kind of a something that shadows are things that she uses again and again. Um, and my uh, interpretation was kind of uh, you're being enlightened. For example, she'll say things like. Um, you know, Sarah Gill was um, hidden in the shadows, or the room was very shadowy. And as the reader, you feel like as you learn more and more about what's going on in the story, uh, the shadows are kind of lifting, and you're kind of learning more and more about the world. Um, the the storyline, <clears throat> there's obviously something much bigger going on in this story and, and, and this book one is kind of just cracks the surface. You're dealing with uh, kind of more of a local issue and um, it's such an interesting mix of, um, of, of styles of books I thought. Certainly high fantasy. If you like high fantasy you will love this. Um, it's got a lot of courtly intrigue, which I I love. And another series, if you like courtly intrigue, is um, Robin Hobbs' Farseer trilogy, one of my favorites. Um, there's the romance, and it's just it again. It's so sweet, and it's so it's kind of just the beginnings and the. When you're with somebody and you're you're not sure where you are with the person and it's very playful and um, it's just very a very sweet time for these two characters and I really like that um, and then lastly it's a bit of um, a whodunit um, kind of a mystery like who is the bad guy who um, there's almost some kind of Agatha Christie kind of, um, mechanisms in this book where she'll, you know, this character makes a, uh, uh, reacted strangely to this, um, uh, line of questioning and, you know, oh my gosh, is that person behind all this? Um, you know, she, it's almost like she's trying to throw you off a bit. So there's a bit of, it's almost a bit of a mystery novel thrown into this high fantasy. You have um, wizards and um, there's a really, some really cool characters that are centaurs. And I really liked reading that. Um, beautifully, beautifully done. The setting is so um, lush and well described and well uh, set out. Um, I think it's someone, something is here for, for everyone. So, uh, I'll leave it there. I don't, I'm so nervous of giving, uh, any spoilers. So I hope I haven't. Um, if you like reading fantasy or reading at all, I love to talk about books. Um, or you have any suggestions for me. Um, I'm certainly, I'm already a hundred pages into the, the second novel. So I'll make another uh, video of that when I finish it. Um, but if you have any suggestions for me or recommendations, or if you read this book and you have, you agree with some of the things I've said or, or totally saw it a different way, I'd love to hear your opinion. So um, thanks for watching. Bye.